Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the room, please ensure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent and please not to record or film uh, proceedings. The first item on the agenda is an item of subordinate legislation, consideration of a negative instrument, the Personal Injuries NHS Charges Amount Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has made no comments on this instrument. Are there any comments uh, from members on this item? Uh, there being none, uh, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations on this instrument? Agreed. That is agreed. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is uh, an, an evidence session with the Scottish Ambulance Service. This is one of a series of evidence sessions which the committee is holding with both special health boards and territorial health boards and the committee last took evidence from the SAS on the 23rd of May 2017. So may I this morning welcome to the committee uh, Tom Steele, the chair, uh, Pauline Howie, chief executive, Dr James Ward, medical director and Donna Henry, specialist paramedic, all from the Scottish Ambulance Service. Welcome and thank you for your attendance uh, this morning. Clearly the uh, item of great interest to the public, uh, which uh, we should start with, is the uh, changes in the triage system under which you uh, prioritise calls and respond to calls. And I'd be very interested to uh, explore that. Clearly critical in, in the way that is designed is the response to immediately life-threatening calls. And, and seen the research on that produced by the University of Stirling just the other day. I wonder, though, if I can start by asking about whether you intend to do research on the next category of calls, those which are uh, serious and uh, clinically requiring attention, uh, but not immediately life-threatening. Has there been any work done on that, or is there any work planned uh, on the impact of the change in the system on those types of call? And thank you for inviting us to give evidence to the committee this morning. I may apologise for my croaky voice. I'm afraid some pesky virus has got me, but I'll do my best. Um, I think, to, in answer to your question, I'll refer to Dr Ward, who, who um, will follow up on the question and build on the information which you read last week. Thank you very much. James Ward. Thanks, Tom. Uh, the answer to your question is, is yes. The, the, in essence, the... Uh, response model that we've developed is about all of our patients, uh, whether you are affected by uh, something very, very serious like a cardiac arrest or a heart attack, or whether you're being affected by any other of a range of conditions that we're required to respond to, uh, from a mental health crisis to uh, relatively minor peripheral limb injuries. Uh, the model that we've developed uh, is really based at putting patients right at the centre of all of these uh, response decisions um, and it's based on a huge amount of data and evidence around the requirements of patients right across all elements of our treble nine service and what we do is we look at a range of factors affecting all of these uh, these patients because um, I guess we you know we, we, we've historically been um, had our thinking dominated by response times, and response times are important, but they are one of a number of factors that affect the outcome for patients. So in direct answer to your question, in terms of patients out with uh, our purple and red categories, which are the ones you're referring to under the, the immediately life-threatening uh, basket, there's a huge amount of work being done uh, for patients in our amber category, uh, which is looking at patients affected by uh, chest pain and stroke symptoms, and for our patients in our yellow category uh, who are affected by a whole range of conditions. Thanks very much. Clearly some of these conditions you've mentioned which are in the yellow and amber categories are potentially very serious and, and, and one of the concerns certainly uh, I've had raised with me is that a decision that such a case may not be regarded as a priority uh, could have consequences if the individual is on their own, for example, uh, and if uh, an hour later there may be a level of deterioration that wouldn't have been evident at the outset. Is that something that uh, is acknowledged, and, and, and if so, what can be done to 
uh, ensure that that's Ab addressed? Absolutely. So all the calls we are talking about uh, around this this phase of our uh, response model development are coming in as treble nine calls. So these are all priority calls. Um, one of the challenges when you when you're a clinician and providing clinical care is is to 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 make rational decisions about the the, the acuity of that response. So so for example. Uh, if, if we have two patients who are the same age and one has a, a, an ankle injury and one has uh, severe crushing chest pain, I think we would all agree who we would send the first ambulance to, but we would obviously keep this other patient in mind and be looking to get a timely response to that person as well. Uh, we've, we're continually reviewing um, our responses, both clinically, as I mentioned, but also in terms of time. And in particular, we look at our average response times and uh, the, the extent to which we get to 90% of our patients right across every one of the categories. But not just that, we also look at the patients who are beyond that 90th centile. 90% I mean, is, is pretty good, but actually there are patients beyond that and they matter as well. And so we're continually look, looking at uh, exceptional circumstances, um, uh, refinements to triage, safety netting within armies control and a whole range of issues around making our uh, service delivery as effective as it possibly can. I recall a long time ago as a member of the audit committee, perhaps in 2001, looking at issues of prioritization and categorization of calls uh, and uh, changes, significant changes were made then. What is it about the changes now that is uh, qualitatively different from the changes that were made uh, okay. a number of the, years the, ago? The system that we had up until October 2016 uh, was based on three categories of response, uh, category A, B and C. Category A uh, represented about 33% of our call volume and our target for the category A was to respond to these patients within eight minutes and that was about the be all and end all. Um, listening to staff and patients, there was a lot of frustration around such a large proportion of our call volume being determined as our highest priority. So we set in place a process to look at uh, all of these patients right across the whole treble nine family, if you like, uh, which is divided into over 1200 codes. And what we sought to do and what we did do was understand some very important parameters within these. So for every single code, we can tell you the cardiac arrest rate, we can tell you the conveyance rate, we can tell you whether there are airway or breathing interventions, we can tell you whether the patients are pre-alerted, and we can tell you uh, how sick they are based on their early warning scores. And having got all that information, we set up a hierarchy, uh, which is the purple, red, amber, yellow categories that are in our report. Not only did we recategorize them, however, we also changed the method of response. So for example, in our highest category, which is our purple category, you won't just get the nearest ambulance, you'll get the nearest two resources, because if someone is going to require active resuscitation, you really need three pairs of hands at least. And we've significantly increased the extent to which we get uh, two resources to these patients uh, in as timely a fashion as we ever did. Within that category, the actual cardiac arrest rate in the first year was 52%, uh, which was um, more, than, more than I think we expected, but actually reflected the fact that we looked at other codes that had previously had a lower response and we put them into this category. So essentially, for the codes that go into our highest acuity category, which is the purple category, we know that these people are sick and in immediate life-threatening circumstances. And what that does, if you align your response to accurately identifying these patients, is give you the best opportunity to save lives. Now, when we set off at this, we had no idea what would happen in terms of 24-hour or 30-day survival. But certainly what we've seen in the first year from the old system to the new system is a 43% increase in 30-day survival. And for all the other codes, very stable 30-day survival outcomes. So essentially what we've done from the old system to the new is taken uh, an evidence base um, and sought to implement that on a national scale. Um, we have, more, given the evidence that we gathered before, we were able to sense check that uh, as we went along. So every week, every month, every quarter, every six months, every year, we've been refining this data to check that we've got patients 
uh, allocated in the right uh, element of the response model. And we have made some refinements over time, not many, probably between six and ten over the year in terms of moving codes based on uh, what we found. But generally, and this is what you would expect when you look at so many uh, calls in your preparation, in your planning, uh, then it's good to see that that's been borne out in terms of the way they said the, the model has worked. Thank you very much. Before I bring in colleagues, I wonder if I could ask Donna Henry to perhaps provide a staff perspective in terms of attendance on scene of what difference the new model has made in practical terms, in terms of your sense of getting to the right people at the right time. Um, well, in two different ways, I'm often used to attend the immediate life-threatening calls as a second response with a third pair of hands. And in that respect, I feel as though it's been really useful because I'm able then to travel with the crews and without taking like too many other resources away, we're able to um, give that um, purple or, or red call that, you know, the immediate help and care that they need and, and I'm able to be utilised to help them. And I find that that's, been, that's happening every single time for me um, or somebody's coming to back me up like really, really rapidly. So I feel that works from my, from my point of view. And the other um, category of calls, like the, the less uh, life-threatening, like the yellow or amber calls, the ones that I'm more often sent to as a specialist paramedic, because these are the ones that we can hopefully um, treat at home or have referred to a more appropriate place rather than having them going through the doors of any. Um, so for that category of call, then um, it's, it's developing, it's still developing just now. Um, it's not. It's not always right because the people who are taking the calls are, are basically just working on the, the information that they get. As um, Jim said, every call that comes into the ambulance service is a 999 call. So these calls have got to be categorised. And at the moment, we're um, trying to define the codes so that the calls that we are sent to specialist paramedics are more appropriate and more, more um, probably able to be left at home or be treated at home or referred on to a more appropriate place, which hopefully will be in the patient's best interests and the patient's family's best interests. Thank you very much. Alec Colhampton. I'll bring you in a moment, Sandra. Yeah, Alec Colhampton. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good morning to the panel. And could I put on record my thanks for everything you do for us and uh, congratulations indeed in the demonstrable increase in saved lives under the new system. But as a constituency MSP, obviously we hear more about the cases which are left waiting as a result of the triaging system. Now, I don't suggest that, that that system is wrong, but I do have some questions about um, the waits that sometimes people who have non-life threatening um, situations uh, can, can have to suffer. I had a constituent who fell in the street in Christophen, um last winter, um, well, about this time last year, um, and he was in his late 70s and had to wait nearly three hours for an ambulance. Um, when you said, James Ward, um, that you keep those patients in mind, what do you do to monitor the situation around those individuals who aren't life-threatening but may have to wait more than an hour for uplift? Okay, uh, if I can start by saying... Um that the prioritisation uh, that we do, ob obviously we are, we are prioritising resources, but that is by no means the singular cause of delays in response. And I can, I can come on to, to more about that if, if you wish. In terms of the specific patient for whom we do not respond in a timely manner, uh, the first thing we do is we, our dispatchers are continually monitoring our resources um, in order to make sure that on an ongoing basis every possible resource that could go to that patient uh, is, is being allocated. The second thing is we have a clinical hub within our ambulance control which we've invested in significantly in, in the past few years and their job is to keep in contact with patients such as this for whom we are not aiming to get who we are not able to get to. And at uh, 45 minutes, our aim is to have called back every single one of these patients in order to have uh, A, uh, checked in with them to let them know that they are in our system and we are responding, but B, and probably more importantly, to check that there's been no deterioration and that their condition uh, doesn't need to be uh, escalated to, to a, higher, a higher priority. So on that, um, if we take my constituent, uh, for example, if he'd had a... a, a serious fracture mm -hmm. and gone into a state of shock, possibly 
underlying heart condition we didn't yeah. know about if it then became a life threatening situation um you would pick that up in that monitoring process is that right that that would be the absolutely the intention um and the and the if the, the priority allocated to that call would then be based on the most recent information that we had. So if, if as you say, a, a, a patient, and uh, obviously I can't refer to your uh, direct constituent, but if a patient in general had deteriorated um, as, as part of our, uh, uh, we'd picked up as part of our interventions, then absolutely that would be, that would be reprioritised within the system. By all means, um, yeah. I wanted to add, um, in terms of some of the adaptations that we've made that Jim spoke about earlier on, um, just before um, winter 2018, um, we took the learning from previous cases, such as the one that you referred to, um, and we have looked to see how we can recategorise um, those patients that are particularly vulnerable in outside places that might be might be fractured too. So we haven't seen those types of patients uh, waiting just as long as they had in, in previous winters. So there's been a lot of learning, as Jim said, in terms of the implementation of this of this model. That's very good to hear. Just one more. And on the same point, uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton, um, I too experienced what you experienced. What I like to go out with crews with, um, on a fairly regular basis, and um, this, this patient had had indeed fallen this time in, in, a, in a bookie shop, um, and, but had been there for three hours, and, and that struck home very closely with me. And, and as a result of that, the chief executive and the board were very keen to look at these vulnerable patients who, because they're in a public place and because they're outside, um, are subject to more clinical risk than they would be otherwise. And we have reacted to that in the way that the Chief Executive has said. Final question on this, if I may, Convener. Um, we're going to come on to a discussion about staff morale, but can I ask, in those cases where people have had to wait hours for an ambulance, um, have your staff, um, frontline staff, noticed an uptick in aggression or abusive behaviour, people who are and understandably fed up and maybe distressed as well. But is that a factor that plays into the morale discussion? Maybe I'd, perhaps Donna, your best place to answer this. Um, well, yes, it does. And like I kind of alluded to earlier, the, I mean, the codes and things are all still developing and we do still get a little bit, why did we not get sent to that? But you've got to bear in mind, we don't know what the big picture is. We don't know what other calls are going on. We just know what we're sent to. But um, but when it does work, when it when it does work, but you get when, for example, if I'm sent to a patient who is a, 70, a 75 year old that I dealt with last last week, 75 year old at home alone, um, suffering from difficulty in breathing, she managed to phone 999. She phoned um, for the ambulance. I, after the call was triaged, I was sent um, to attend to her. Her um, symptoms were um, an exacerbation of her COPD and she had a bit of a chest infection. With that, I was able to do an advanced assessment on her and make a clinical decision um, based on her past medical history. And I was able to help that lady stay at home without the, well, the increased risk of having to take her through to the hospital. Obviously, I was able to contact a, an out of hours GP just for some uh, professional to professional support. And I also contacted her family who were absolutely delighted that their mother wasn't going to be dragged out of bed at that time in the morning. And um, taken to the hospital so it works and when it works like that it makes me feel like really glad to do that job and then the flip side of that if somebody's been waiting for the three hours for with a, a, an elderly relative outside in the cold do you get pushback and anger sometimes it's as well? extremely frustrating but obviously that, that i guess that's a um not a, a regular occurrence i'm thinking that that's quite a rare thing that happens and when there's a pressure of other emergency calls um, it would be just a case of trying to explain it. It does make me feel sad for the patient, but I would like to think that I'm able to explain it um, to the patient in a, in a way that they'll accept. Thank you. Sandra, you are right. Thank, thank you very much, Kavina, and good morning. And can I put on record, uh, I'm so grateful for the you know, service that we, we receive. And I certainly you know, downloaded uh, this, uh, this paper today, which says clinical response model saves an extra 1,182 lives and I think that's uh, good positive news <clears throat> but what I wanted to do was <clears throat> go back to the, the original first question <clears throat> excuse me maybe I've picked up your um, 
called. <clears throat> Basically, for, for the basics, uh, I mean, it's not just all about the eight minute, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many other people, as you said yourself, the paramedics. And I just wonder if you could talk us through. I'm, I know what goes on, uh, basically, but when somebody calls, the operators have a great deal to, to do with that as well. Uh, in regards to that, even if it's maybe longer than eight minutes, they will you know, decide and, and talk people through it. And then, obviously, you mentioned the paramedic. And then the ambulance. And uh, I note that uh, the response model now is to basically, if someone has had a stroke, to be able to determine that and perhaps rather than go to a local hospital or whatever, is to go to the, the most... Uh, appropriate in that respect. Now, I just wondered, because unfortunately I've had that experience in the past couple of uh, months or a year, uh, I'm quite familiar with it. But obviously the public itself may not be as familiar with it. So I just wondered the public's understanding of this new model. Do they understand that uh, if they phone, etc., etc., and how do you have a better understanding from the public? If they phone 999, they may not necessarily get you know, an ambulance here in eight minutes. So what is the procedure? It's just to put on the record, it's not just about the eight minutes, it's everyone working together. <coughs> Absolutely. So I'll just talk you through exactly what happens when yes. you phone treble nine, because I think that's part of what you're getting at, then I'll mm -hmm. come on to. So um, the first thing we need to do is, is establish where the patient is. Um, so we'd, we'd invested in a bit of technology so that if they phone from certain or from landlines, that auto auto populates. That saves a bit of time. If they're phoning on mobiles, we're not quite there yet. So we have to establish the location. That's really important, especially if you lose contact with the, with the patient. The second thing that happens is, uh, so this is you maybe 20 seconds into the call, and, and the, the caller will be asked, is the patient breathing? Mm -hmm. And if the answer to that is no, that will automatically generate a purple response and we will send the two nearest resources. And we're dispatching the first of those resources, usually in about 45 seconds from treble nine. If the answer to that question is yes, then we will say, is the patient awake? And if the answer to that is no, then we will generate a red response. And this is on the basis of evaluating thousands of calls mm -hmm. and actually understanding the journey. So what that means is that even before people enter triage, which is what I'm going to talk about next, we've identified a lot of our most critically ill patients just by what we call pre-entry questions. The next question then is, can you tell me exactly what has happened? And that's when our call takers have to listen and often listen to a very stressed person mm -hmm. or someone who might not know who the patient is. They might, they might be someone they've come across in the street or whatever. So they have to get the really good listening skills. And then what they're doing is establishing what's called a chief complaint and that establishes a, one of our, our cards, and there are 32 different card sets which take you down everything from trauma to chest pain to breathing difficulties, etc. And at the end of that process, which usually takes about two minutes, we will have established a final code. And on the basis of that final code, our dispatchers will allocate the nearest ambulance. It's probably worth stressing that you know all of the delays that we're talking about here are within our yellow category, um, which is our, our biggest basket of calls. It's probably worth notice, noting that we get to 50% of those calls in about 15 minutes, and we get to 90% of them in less than 50 minutes. And that's been data over the whole year. Uh, it's probably also worth saying that this December, due to a whole lot of improvements that we made, our, our response times were significantly better than last year, despite a 5% increase in purple and red demand. So, we're learning as we go. The final bit for a relatively small proportion of our calls is that we will say we need uh, some more information in order to determine the right response. And that further information can be gathered by our uh, uh, clinical advisors, or for a certain proportion of patients, it can be gathered by NHS 24. Mm. There are There is a continual crossover between us and NHS 24 when people will phone 111, but they really need an ambulance, or people will phone 999, but actually their, their, their acuity is such that they would get a better service. In all the time that we've been uh, delivering these changes, uh, and we've been working with 24 for three, four years, I, I can't remember a single complaint that we've had about a patient who was who, who was pushed mm -hmm. in that direction. And I think that that's all about how, how things are done. It's about the quality of the communication. You know, so we make a very, very robust attempt to understand exactly how sick that person is. 
And then if we ask permission to get additional triage from them, you know, some additional <coughs> information, maybe somebody pass their call over or someone call them back uh, within 15 minutes, then generally people are, are pretty accepting of that. Mm -hmm. Chair, could I just, just a very, very small addition to that. Uh, thank you very much for that. I just want to know, how do we get that across to the public? Because obviously, as Alec Cole Hamilton said and others have said, we have constituents that come to us that don't quite understand. So how do we get that across to the public that they know that even though they're on the phone to somebody and they can give them very good information, the ambulance is coming at the same time type thing or you know they're being assessed. How do we get that across to the public that they don't straight away? The, for the chair, uh, Tom Steele. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm pleased to pick that up. Um, so the, the old, the old eight-minute model's been around since 1974. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in the public psyche. Mm -hmm. But actually, in terms of holding the organisation to account, which is the, the, the um, role I have in the board, it's, it's pretty useless, to be honest. And, mm -hmm. and you've, you've heard Dr Ward explain the new structure um, and, and all these four categories. We have very clear expectations, that, um, which we report to government um, every week on as well as in the eight minute response um, and going forward i think it would it would be uh, very much in our collective interest for the public to understand now how mm -hmm. we are operating this very effective new model um, so we are keen to 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 publicize that as as but but equally we don't want to do something which which would frustrate an, an eight minute uh, um, continued scrutiny from government mm. thank you very much emma harper Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, everybody. I just before I ask my question, I'd like to just echo the comments that uh, Sandra White made about the new model saving lives. I think that is actually it's good news to get some good news for a change. And Sandra does make a great point about um, the public's knowledge about the whole process. I think it is really important that we engage them, especially when we're going down new models of care, where you've got paramedic units going to people's homes and keeping them out of hospital because of a COPD exacerbation. So, but um, I am going to move on to talk about the Police Scotland's um, uh, comments that uh, they're spending more time in emergency rooms because of accompanying people with mental health issues or other issues. And I would be interested to know what your opinions are about Police Scotland's comments of their extra time spent. I'd like to see some further evidence about that, though, as well. But is it possible that the new um, model has actually exacerbated the amount of time that the police are spending in A&E departments? Pauline Hurry. Thank you. Both ourselves and Police Scotland um, are working together jointly to do much better for patients that are presenting with mental health distress issues. So we've got a number of um, initiatives underway. We are involved as a Scottish Ambulance Service in the four distress brief intervention pilots that are happening in various localities across the country. And as recently as three weeks ago, we made our 2019th referral to a distress brief intervention uh, pathway up in the Highlands. Um, and the, the patient experience and the feedback from those is very, very positive indeed. Um, there are a limited number of pathways for our paramedics and other staff to refer into for those patients that present in mental health distress but don't have any physical injuries or illnesses that would require attendance in an accident and emergency department. So ourselves and Police Scotland are looking to see how we can better identify those patients and refer them to alternative pathways where those exist and where they might not exist at the times that patients need them. Uh, then we're working through the integrated joint boards to try to present the data so that we can come up with better pathways for those patients that meet their conditions at that point of time so that we're not taking people unnecessarily to accident and emergency departments or indeed police aren't taking them to accident emergency departments or worse still in terms of police custody as, as well. So we've got um, a pilot uh, just about to go live in Lanarkshire with Police Scotland, with NHS 24 and ourselves. Um, and we would uh, be really delighted to explain uh, the evaluation of that to the committee in, in due course. OK, I would be... Thanks, yeah. Thanks very much. Th there was a pilot recently done, wasn't there, in Glasgow of... Um, street triage, and uh, that was partly to divert people from A&E when they didn't need to go there. 
Is there an evaluation of that in place yet? That we could so, so the evaluation see? of that is, is, is underway. It right. was in a small cohort um, of um, postcodes within, within Glasgow, and um, there is certainly um, an appetite between both organisations to look to see how we could extend that pilot at the appropriate times. So um, we have also got um, a similar model up in, the, in Inverness, for example, and we target that type of response at certain times of the year and on certain occasions, and it seems to uh, be very effective. Well, one concern this committee has had, I guess, over, the t over time across the NHS is that some very good things are piloted. The pilots are evaluated to be successful, but then they're not rolled out. What, what's your intentions in regard to uh, this type of, the, well, the two pilots you've mentioned today, for example? And, and, and the issue is about sustainability in terms of being able to make sure that we've got uh, the sustainability of the workforce um, and able to deploy those assets that we put on appropriately so that they're, they're well, they're well utilised. So those are the types of issues that we ask uh, to be evaluated so that we can scale up where that is appropriate. But certainly uh, the pilot in, in Lanarkshire we think um, should be capable of scaling up. We've looked at the research from across the UK and uh, the triage um, from police and ambulance um, into um, more um, appropriate um, and robust uh, referral pathways uh, certainly seems to be one that is sustainable and evaluates it well, which is why we're, we're testing it out in, in the Scottish setting. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Steele. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, we have, we have a, a clo close working relationship with the other two Category 1 responders, the police and the fire and rescue service. And, and on a regular basis, um, the three heads of service and three chairs meet and discuss issues such as this. And at the last meeting in December, uh, the, the men mental health approach was uh, indeed one of the items on the agenda. Um, so that was one point I wanted to make. The other point was, and, and, and perhaps Dr Ward could speak to this, but, but I'd, I don't believe there's any evidence that, that the new model is having any impact at all on the amount of time the police are spending in the EDs. Okay, can you? Uh, no, I just, just, just to be absolutely clear, um, we, we do not uh, change the acuity of our response to a patient based on the police being in attendance or not. Um, I think you mentioned the wider NHS convener, um, and I think that's at the heart of this issue, because essentially... Um, we have to work within the ambulance service. There's a there's a, a a start to this journey that's before someone phones treble nine. So you need to be looking at things like anticipatory care and and, and planning and and uh, uh, primary care. And then there's appropriate pathways once once we've triaged uh, patients. And I think um, what causes frustration uh, for patients is. Uh, where they feel they're being delayed at any part on that journey, whether it's waiting for an ambulance, whether it's waiting for an ambulance to get an ED, whether it's waiting to see a, a mental health specialist once you're in the ED. Um, and, and I think it's for all of us to work together to actually understand flow right across the system um, and make sure that, that response to people is optimised uh, in these circumstances. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Just a wee quick sup, actually. Um, NHS and Fries and Galway have police on site in their ED department, so I'm assuming that would allow a handover um, so that other police who are s delivering people to a &E departments wouldn't then have to remain around. But is that part of a model that's looked at in conjunction with the uh, other health boards across Scotland? So there are different uh, models models in place, um, but as part of the mental health uh, strategy, um, there uh, is an, an ambition to get more mental health professionals into accident and emergency departments so that they can um, look after those patients that are presenting with mental health conditions. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Clearly, as colleagues have commented, increased lives saved is, is, is a very significant criterion. Nonetheless, I think it's um, important to uh, note that some of the targets for immediately life-threatening uh, responses are not being achieved, uh, and also to note that the, the targets are not for 100% of response within eight minutes. I wonder if you could explain why the targets were set um, for those that are immediately life-threatening uh, circumstances and why they are being missed, given that the number of eight-minute response time 
uh, calls has or the proportion has reduced significantly. Okay. So, so the um, the eight minute response target applied to the old category A basket, which, as I said, was. 33% of our call volume. Um, we no longer have a Category A response, um, but that eight-minute target uh, is currently being applied to our purple and red criteria. You might be interested to, to know that within the purple basket, as I've said already, the cardiac arrest rate is 52%, or was 52% in the first year, and the cardiac arrest rate in the red category was 1.5%. So that tells me two things. It tells me that we are absolutely identifying the sickest people in our highest priority. But it also tells me that an assumption that we made in the planning phase that purple and red would equate to immediate life threatening isn't necessarily what's been borne out. Um, the eight minute target uh, is, I can understand why it was put there. Um, <coughs> But it's actually lost its relevance, and particularly it's lost its relevance to clinicians within the system. We get to the sickest people as quickly as we possibly can, um, and that's actually when the role of the paramedic begins. Can I just interrupt you there? Because you say you're, 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 you're saying the eight-minute target is, is now not relevant, or is, but it remains... It remains the criterion to which yeah. the service works. So, so recognising mm -hmm. that it may not be adequate for all circumstances, I, I, I think I'd be very keen to understand whether or not the Scottish Ambulance Service remains committed to the eight-minute target for immediately life-threatening uh, calls. Ab absolutely. We, we, we are committed to trying our best to deliver every target that's been agreed as part of our um, delivery plan. Absolutely. Um, in addition to that, what, we, what we've been reporting on uh, over the last two years has been both median and 90 uh, centile response times for purple, red, amber, uh, well, purple and red publicly, and more recently at our board, amber and yellow, because we feel we need to put all this information out there, particularly as has been highlighted the concern uh, around the times when there are uh, longer delays. What I would say as a clinician would be that uh, a, a more nuanced uh, use of targets and indicators, and particularly looking at stratification across uh, the response criteria is, is, a, is a much better way to go. So, for example, we look at both median and 90th centile for a purple, red, amber and yellow, and we set some indicators at the start of this because we were looking to uh, benchmark our performance against other services and also internally hold ourselves to account for what our expectations would be. Um, so those internal measures uh, we've generally been uh, achieving or very close to across the piece, and particularly for the highest acuity patients, even during the times of exceedingly high demand. And I guess this is one of the, one of the issues where the transition from an established performance framework to a new performance framework that takes into account new evidence, new ways of working, uh, the paramedic skill set, the, the issues such as Donna mentioned around uh, shifting the balance of care, looking after more, more people at home, and actually moving to understand both response times, which are important, but also outcomes for patients, is, is the kind of suite of measures that we're, that we're looking to develop and, and uh, hopefully agree with our sponsors. I understand the clinician's uh, in, uh, focus on outcomes. That's absolutely right. But nonetheless, in terms of the measurement of performance, I, I, and I, I look to, to, to the whole panel, really, um, to confirm that the measurement of performance remains something to which the ambulance service is committed. Uh, the, the cardiac arrest target that you have is 80% responses within eight minutes, and your achievement is 71%, and therefore falls short of the target. And, and, and I'd be keen to understand whether you would share my concern about those numbers, or simply see it as part of the process of, of, of change that Dr. Ward has described. I, um, <clears throat> I, I do see it as a concern, uh, um, but in context. So I became chair of the ambulance service nine months ago. Um, with a, a background recently in, in healthcare at, uh, on the board of NHS Lanarkshire, but before that in business. And 
it, it seems to me that if you're measuring an organisation, you've got to achieve the best quality you can within the resources you have available and, and with, uh, with uh, a motivated and, uh, and um, satisfied staff. And, and so in relation to the, the response times, they've got to be meaningful in, the, in, in that sense. And, and while we still look at the eight-minute response, it, it's, it's a bit of a sledgehammer, and, and, and I hope that the, the Dr. Ward has been giving the indication as, as to the nuance that we're now suggesting and the standards which we are using, and, the, and, this, and my board is using internally at every board meeting, uh, looking at response to purple times, with, with a mean of, of six minutes, and, and, we're, we're, and we're beating that. Reds with, with uh, a median of seven minutes, um, and, and we're beating that. And, and, and we have targets in place, or standards at least, for the uh, amber categories and, and the yellow categories. And these are being scrutinised uh, at every board meeting. Um, and, and in terms of ensuring that we're using the, the, the finances available to us in, in the most effective way, that we're person-centred, that we're safe, um, to me, it's just it's, this is a more meaningful system, and, and one which I would commend to to the, the committee. Um, uh, this is, and we're not doing this in isolation. England have moved to a similar, although not identical, system about a year ago. Wales moved in a similar time scale. Um, ambulance services all over the world, and in Australia, for example, are also have moved into that area. So, so that uh, perhaps that gives you some context for for. for the, 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 old, the old target and the new standards. Yeah, uh, it's, certainly, it's, certainly, it's certainly important that we understand how you understand the targets you still adhere to. Um, and, and I think one of my colleagues mentioned earlier that uh, quite a number of communities lie, out, lie further than eight minutes from an ambulance station. And therefore, I wonder if you could explain Given that you still have this eight-minute target for immediately life-threatening cases, how that is actually applied in the context of the very large areas of rural Scotland? Perhaps the chief exec could answer that and, and also refer to the community and, and clinical first responders. Yes, so we have a variety of responders um, across the whole the whole country, um, including in uh, the very remote and, and rural um, areas. We have been significantly um, increasing um, our investment in remote and rural parts of Scotland. The new clinical response model is part of a wider five-year programme of investment and reform. We're investing in more staff, we're investing in the skills and the development of the existing uh, staff and we're investing in new assets and equipment and processes and technology as part of that five-year strategy too. Um, particularly in remote and rural areas, we have a network um, of first responders that work uh, very closely uh, with, our, with our ambulance uh, crews and they're, they're a vital part of our, of our response. Uh, we have a new uh, wildcat um, response to cardiac arrest uh, patients uh, that's been going on now for, for over a year and uh, evaluating very well in terms of their ability uh, to get to those cardiac arrest patients uh, in support of our crews too. We've got our air ambulance um, service um, and uh, members will be aware um, that we from April this year will be um, having a Scotstar North base um, in Aberdeen that will significantly enhance capability and capacity up in the north of Scotland to help those rural communities as well. And we've been working very closely in conjunction with our staff representatives around how we can further reduce on-call working uh, in those remote and rural um, areas. There's been a significant reduction in on-call uh, working over, over the past past a few years, but there's more that we want to do, uh, and that's linked to new ways of working. So uh, we have agreed a prioritised uh, list of locations where we want to further reduce on-call uh, working with our staff partners, um, and three locations out of that list in the last year have now become full 24-7 shift working stations, and we announced a few weeks ago um, that a fourth in Portree um, would be recruited to so that we can eliminate on-call in that, in that place um, too. So we've got more to do. As I said, it's part of a five-year uh, programme of investment and reform, but we're absolutely committed to ensuring that we can improve outcomes for patients in remote and rural communities as well. That's very helpful. Just for our understanding, does the attendance of a first responder uh, remove the obligation or the, or the target, if you like, for a, a, a crewed vehicle to attend within eight minutes? So the, 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 the recognised responder that works to our clinical governance standards, it does 
count uh, against the clock, but it's the, the responder is backed up um, by, by a crew. OK, thank you very much. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good morning, panel. And can I echo the comments made by my colleagues to thank all the frontline staff that do such a great job throughout Scotland. I know covering the hands and hands how important a service that is. Can I focus on staffing and HR issues? Um, I've looked um, quite carefully at the Employee Engagement Index score, which showed that the Scottish Ambulance Service had the worst or the lowest score of all boards. And if you look at the 2017 Dignity at Work uh, survey, the scores were the worst in the following domains about staff experience unfair discrimination from managers, uh, unfair discrimination from colleagues, and bullying and harassment from managers. I mean, is there a culture of bullying within the organisation? We were very concerned um, at the, the Dignity at, at Work um, results, um, and um, we have been working <coughs> very closely to understand um, those, those results. Um, you'd be aware that as part of the um, NHS Scotland staff experience uh, measures, uh, we use the iMatter staff experience index to which, to which you referred um, to, and the uh, results from that have a much greater participation, almost a double the amount of people participating in our service in the iMatter than the, than the Dignity um, at Work um, findings. Nevertheless, we are concerned um, about those, those findings, and we have been working across the country to engage with staff to understand what their experience is and what more we can do because violence, bullying and harassment is completely unacceptable uh, for our staff and our volunteers in terms of the fantastic job that they, they do day in and, and day out. As a result of that um, bullying and um, the, the Dignity at Work survey a couple of years ago, uh, we set up a network of confidential harassment advisors for people um, so that staff, if they feel uh, that there are any um, issues that they can contact contact them confidentially. Um, we have very regular reporting through our governance committees, our health, safety and wellbeing committee and our staff governance committee, which reports um, into our board about any specific um, cases uh, that we are concerned about. And we have been investing significantly in our leadership and management development so that we can continue to create supportive and encouraging networks um, for our people given particularly um, the amount that we are investing um, in terms of their development and we want them to, to feel supported uh, to work well in what is often a very emotionally and physically demanding uh, job right up and down and down the, the country. So we're absolutely not, not complacent. Uh, we are pleased, however, that the participation rate, participation rate um, continues to increase, that those teams that are taking action as a result of the feedback at a local level and throughout the whole organisation is very strong, 89%, which is 30% higher than the whole of the, the rest of the, the NHS um, health and social care um, participants in the in, in the survey and we're, we're pleased uh, that people report that they get a tremendous sense of satisfaction um, from 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 their job um, but we've much much more to do and we want to continue on the, on that journey thank you thank you um, on, on the same point um, and, and I mentioned that I've uh, been chair for nine months and, and have been out and about a lot and and I'm concerned about the, some of these results but I'm also a, a bit con conflicted by it because when I'm out and about and talking to staff, I, I get a lot of enthusiasm um, for the for the job they do and and the role they do, um, and we also have a, a very low staff turnover of just over four um, percent and and a very low vacancy level <clears throat> of a few, a few. Stop you there. I mean. Um I'm obviously subject to correction there, Mr Steele, but my understanding is that staff turnover among ambulance personnel is the second highest of all staff groups. I, I was referring to the whole organisation, the chief exec. Yeah, um, our latest, we monitor staff turnover um, on a <coughs> monthly basis and the latest figures as at uh, the end of January were 4.1% with 25 vacancies, which is the lowest number it's been in a, in a long, long time. How does that compare with other boards in Scotland? Um, I think our turnover rate is lower um, mm. than, than other, other boards. Yeah. Um, and we, as, as Tom Steele mentioned, we, can, we work very closely with the other UK ambulance services um, and our vacancy rate, I know, is a lot lower than other UK ambulance services. Okay, sorry, Mr Steele. No, no, no that, your point's well made. Um, 
so 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 there's evidence on one side, and and, and there's there's and I and I you know, have, have experience of working in many many different industries and businesses, and 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 it's unusual for to to. Um, and, and it is anecdotal, I accept that, but it's unusual to, to get the level of enthusiasm. And, and at least double numbers of people have said to me, of paramedics and technicians, that's that they've got the best job in the world. I, I would be quite keen for, for Donna Henry to say a few words. Um, I've been in the Scottish Ambulance Service for almost 25 years. And um, I never thought that when I joined the Ambulance Service that would be my job for life. Thankfully, hopefully it is. Unless I say something wrong the day. <laughs> no, um, but I, when I first joined the ambulance service, I was like one of the only females that were in the job, and I, it was much different then. The culture was much different then, um, and it was pretty anti-females. Probably 24, mm. 25 years ago, I might have felt in a, in a, um, you know how I feel about my job and feeling bullied and all that. Might have been a lot different, but I see a massive culture change even just in the last 10 to 15 years, and. I, I certainly don't see any bullying or harassment. I think um, compared to some of my friends in other jobs, um, we've got uh, we've got policies to protect us in almost everything that we do. We've got um, opportunities to to engage in all different kinds of activities within our work now. And, we've, uh, and I'm part of the Health and Wellbeing Committee. I do a lot of the health, healthy working life stuff. So we arrange lots of things like lots of activities and lots of um, wellbeing type things to try and improve staff well-being. So I think that as far as bullying and harassment are concerned, I certainly mm. don't feel that or see that, and I've mm. been around a bit. Yeah, thank you for that. Can I just, so you can be, the other indicator of health of any organisation, and like yourself, Mr. Say, I've been involved in a number of organisations, would, would be sickness rates. It's certainly something I would look at very carefully. And you'll know that the target was 5% in 17, 18, but the actual rate was 7.6. And of course, I understand that in day-to-day -day life, you meet very dedicated staff like Donna Hendry, who, who obviously speak very positively with the organisation. But I would actually look at what the stats say. I would look at the Ding Day at Work survey, the Employment Engagement Index score, and the, the accounts about bullying. The sickness rate is a factual thing. It's higher than your target. Um, what are you going to do to try and reduce the rate of sickness in the organisation? Um, I'll ask the Chief Executive to, to respond to that in a second, but, yeah, but absolutely I agree that it, it, is, a, it is a high sickness rate. So 7.6 is, is, is a high rate, and, and um, the rate which I think we're still at currently. Um, however, compared to other ambulance services elsewhere in, in uh, the UK and, and abroad, um, all have significantly higher levels of sickness absence than the rest of their healthcare system. Or, uh, and. I think that reflects the, the uh, physically demanding uh, and, and uh, mentally extremely stressful role that the paramedics and wider staff play. Um, so, we, so we are, I think, increasingly aware of that and increasingly responding to that in, in a way which raises awareness initially. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully it will reduce sickness yeah. absence. But it is, it's it's of great concern to me that that, that we have a, the, the the level is is of a concern. But equally, the health and, and well-being of our staff is a concern. Yeah. I mean, again, you could perhaps send us the comparative sickness rates from the other organisations you quote. But yeah. again, if I was running an organisation, if I thought the going rate was 7.5, I'd made the target 7.5. Why did you make the target five if you didn't actually achieve it? Well, I'll ask the chief exec to to respond to that. Please. So, so there, there are national targets for uh, sickness absence in, in, in NHS um, Scotland um, and the um, ambulance service um, tries to reduce sickness absence as you would expect. Uh, the top two reasons for sickness absence in our service are musculoskeletal um, type illnesses um, and um, mental health um, type illnesses, anxiety, stress and, and depression. Um, and, um, as I said earlier on, our, our staff do an outstanding job in really trying circumstances, very emotionally distressing circumstances. They see uh, the worst and the best um, in, in, a, in any shift of, 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 of life and, and death in, 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 in people's, people's um, circumstances. And it's often a very physically demanding job. So we've been investing significantly um, in new equipment in new policies and procedures. We've got an economics advisor, one of the only UK ambulance services that's got an economics <laughs> advisor to help in terms of advice around equipment, around manual handling, uh, lifting, etc. 
Um, and in terms of our approach to supporting staff around their mental health and wellbeing, it's an area that we've been paying a lot of attention to, um, as other industries um, have seen an increase in, in that area mm. um, as, as well. Um, so we have got a number um, of programmes, um, we've got a number of employee assistance programmes that are well utilised by, by staff, and those people that do use those programmes report an improvement in terms of their mental health and wellbeing, and indeed in, th in mm. those uh, that access or fast track physiotherapy, for example, they report an improvement in those in those mm. outcomes as, as well. There's more, more we want to do, particularly in terms of how we support um, people around their mental health and wellbeing uh, too. So we're working across the UK ambulance services to understand what works uniquely in our environment because, because it is quite a unique environment and we're also working with the other emergency services in <coughs> Scotland as, as, as well to understand what they're doing and how we can learn from each other and share where mm. that makes sense uh, to do so as well. But so we you can make that sound, sorry interrupting, that sounds very positive. Are you going to meet your 18-19 sickness target at 5%? We, as, as Tom Seal says, we, we are sitting at similar levels um, to, to last year, um, but we're absolutely not complacent. We want to do more to support people uh, to, to be well and, 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 and to attend um, in the best of health. So, uh, if I can just push in that, because you didn't really answer mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. What is the target currently for 18, 19? We haven't completed yes. the year, obviously, but yeah. you'll, you'll yeah. have a trend yeah. from the, the, the HR the, department. Mm -hmm. Yes, the target is remains at five percent, and what as Tom and, and Tom said, we're sitting at seven point six percent at the moment. So it's the same as it was yeah. the previous year. So yeah. I mean, what you've suggested seems a sensible management approach, mm -hmm. but the rate hasn't changed at all. Yeah. What is the cost to organisation of that level of staff absence? So we uh, monitor the abstractions and we try to um, cover as many of those abstractions as we as we possibly um, can. Um, and there are a number of ways that we can cover. We have um, what we call relief members of staff uh, that are, are, are built in for um, a, a predicted uh, level of sickness absence. And we also can ask uh, staff uh, to work additional shifts to help cover. And because of the additional investment in our service, we've got um, over 500 more staff uh, now in place than we had in 2015, um, our shift coverage rates have significantly increased. Yeah, could I, you may not have this figure in front of you, it's mm -hmm. not fair to ask you uh, in detail, but what is what is the difference to the, your budget if you had a 7.6 sick, 6 sickness rate versus 5%, because presumably there's extra cost to your budget because you're having to cover the staff mm -hmm. that are off long-term sick. Yes. Have you got? Have you had some calculation from your finance department about the cost to your budget of having a differential and above target sickness rate? I don't have that figure at the top of my mind at the no, moment. I, I can, cer I can <laughs> certainly get back to you because we do we do monitor that through our finance department. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. That would be helpful. Emma Harper. Thank you. It's a couple of questions about primary care. And uh, I'm interested in the, the jobs that people do. So we've got uh, ambulance care assistants, we've got paramedics, specialty paramedics, and we've got technicians. And I don't want people to think that technicians are just drivers because both paramedics and techs drive and care for people. So I want to get it right out there that um, paramedics and technicians are highly skilled. They're both highly skilled when they're, when they're crewing ambulances and uh, resource cars. Um, and there's just some differences might be given morphine, given um, thrombolizing agents or uh, tension pneumothorax treatment. In that, so I would just like to hear a wee bit about the differences in the jobs, and to be clear that uh, everybody who's staffing are competent and skilled uh, professionals. It might be a question for Donna, and, and, and perhaps also within that, the shift in the balance of the workforce as well. As far as that. <coughs> Donna, a yes, sir. so, so um, you're absolutely right. Uh, our well. All of our patient-facing staff provide clinical care, and that inc includes our ambulance care assistants on patient transport. You know, they, they they have a duty of care from the from the second they, they arrive. Um, our, our, the bulk of our clinical care is provided by a combination of paramedics and technicians working as a as a as a team. And you're absolutely right; they're both clinicians, and there are some differences in terms of. Uh, um, kind of uh, skill set, if you like. Uh, we've also recently been looking at advanced practice, and Donna's Don a, a good example of, of, of that kind of stratification of clinical 
uh, with, with, within the workforce. One of the things that we did uh, in terms of the response model was uh, as, as well as categorising um, in terms of a kind of uh, colour-based approach which relates to time, it also uh, defines the skill set. So, for example, if we've got a patient with, uh, with a particular condition that we think will require uh, paramedic intervention based on the fact that patients in that code often do, then that's what we will that's what we will uh, aim to uh, to send to that patient. Uh, we're also investing a lot in uh, guidelines, additional training, additional equipment. Major trauma is a, a really good example of that. We've completely transformed the kit that's on our ambulances in terms of major trauma and new medicines. Um, and as much as we possibly can, we make these medicines available to everybody, and their the associated training and support is then required. Uh, to, to, to make that follow through. Um, in terms of primary care, we are becoming an ever more relevant part of the primary care system. Um, often that is uh, working in partnership with GPs and, and conveying patients to definitive care, but more and more uh, we're seeing models develop, being developed and tested where uh, paramedics um, including specialists, will actually work within a practice uh, and, and see patients. Uh, and that's a, that's a really interesting development. Um, obviously, we have to be careful to make sure that we maintain our, our core business, and that's always balanced in terms of these uh, areas of thinking. But um, the, 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 the role of the ambulance service uh, is, is, it, it is becoming more and more apparent right across both emergency care but also urgent and primary care. And I think it's a testimony to her staff that they're willing and able to step into that space. So, don't you want to say a bit more, Donna? What's left? Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, you picked up that you're doing more work in primary care, and I'm aware of programmes that are happening in my South Scotland region, in <coughs> Stranraer and Newton Stewart and the Machers, where they're testing models where you would assess a patient instead of a GP or triage and go to someone's home and treat a hypo or something like that. So so that's kind of what I, I'm, I'm interested in is, as well as now we've got m different models where we've got specialty paramedics and, and are we looking at training more so that more wider primary care support can be given? At the moment, um, as a specialist paramedic, I, we, we work in Fife um, and we work within the out of our primary care, we also helped out for a wee while with one of the local GP surgeries who um, basically didn't have a GP, didn't have enough GPs. Um, so what we do is, um, obviously there's, a, there's certain specialists to being a GP, so we don't profess to be GPs, but we can do quite a lot of what the, the calls that the GP, GPs do. So um, we'll basically do home visits for them, or we'll do the um, like chest infections and abdominal pains and that kind of thing that, that come into the surgeries. In and out of hours, we basically do all the home visits, um, apart from specialist things like palliative care or maybe mental health, where we allow the GPs with their, obviously their um, higher level of uh, clinical skill to deal with that. Um, so as part of that, it's, it's allowing us the opportunity to develop our skills, um, doing more minor injury, minor illness type things, um, you know, as opposed to the emergency setting. Um, and they're giving us a bit of mentoring as well while we do that in most of the situations, so it's helping us to develop as specialists and move on to potentially becoming more advanced specialists. So, but as a specialist, um, just to um, emphasise the great skills that all the, the other crews do, we work as a fantastic team. So as part of a, as part of that team, I, I might be able to use, like for example, I uh, um, have, um, I call them D2 resources, to be instead of if, I'm, if one of my patients still needs to go to hospital, I'll be able to um, arrange transport for them if they can't get transport for themselves. But we've got like a variety of different things that we can use rather than using one of our emergency ambulances, which we need for our immediate life-threatening calls. So we can use um, uh, one of our ACAs, our ambulance care assistants. They um, provide transport uh, vehicles. We can um, use a technician vehicle. Sometimes we have an urgent vehicle that has a technician and a and a ambulance care assistant, and they both um, um, pr provide the same kind of emergency care that they would get anybody else because they've still got their ambulance full of or their ambulance kit. The difference between the technician and the paramedic is um, invasive um, techniques like intravenous techniques, intravenous drugs, or like you like you mentioned earlier, the 
the more um, complex care that you would get with the chest and intubation and things like that. And Does that help? Is it too early to assess whether um, keeping out patients out of hospital is has been seen to be really cost effective? Um, have the models been in place long enough that we can assess, uh, I guess, the, the, the best value of keeping people out of hospital because that is additional cost but because that is our goal is to mm -hmm. support people at home as much as possible so so we based um our um our evaluation on a wider work that had been done uh, through the Nuffield Trust um, and they reported in March 2017 about the value, the economic value of community paramedics as, as Donna has, has described um, and they showed um, and we built a, a case around this that for every um, pound invested in uh, community paramedics and the, the wider reform programme <coughs> that I've spoken about this morning, there would be a £4 return to the wider health and social care economy. And certainly our evaluation so far in terms of our model um, bears, bears, bears that out. Thank you very much. Tom Steele. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to add to that, uh, um, I think increasingly we are able to uh, track the journey of the patient. Um, and um, by and we've done a lot of work with ISD recently in in matching records because frequently we don't have, have the, the exact detail we don't have, uh, that, that that they would have in the hospital, but now using sort of uh, fuzzy matching techniques with ISD we're getting much better uh, end to end uh, information, and that includes uh, patients who have stayed at home. Um, and I think that, for me, very important that, that we start working very closely with the IJBs and the partnerships, because um, they are uh, increasingly developing new pathways for patients, and, and, and we can play a significant role in that, and, and Don has indicated some of that. But I think going forward, that, that will be a very much greater part as the pressures on, on GMS and, and GPs become greater. Um, and we're having discussions, early discussions with IGBs um, in that regard, and, and I think that's a significant development for the development for the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to um, the panel. I wanted to pick up on a few points, um, almost return to some of the questions uh, which uh, David Stewart touched upon, and specifically around um, single. Uh, crew ambulances and I know this is something which as far back as 2008 um, the then Health Secretary Nicola Sturgeon said um, would only be in exceptional circumstances. Now um, over the last four years we've seen 10,000 um, single crew ambulance journeys and I just wondered in terms of what the picture is today and what works going on to end that practice. So uh, we have um, very detailed action plans in place to, to reduce um, single crewing so that it only is in very exceptional um, circumstances. Um, and I can report that we are making improvements. Uh, we're not where we want to get to yet. We've got a trajectory to get to <coughs> below 1%. Um, which we think um, would reflect those very exceptional circumstances uh, by, by next year. And it's very much li linked to a recruitment and training and development strategy, and that's why we're, we're not there yet. Uh, but I can give assurance to the committee that we are making improvements um, on that trajectory in, in line with those expectations. And in terms of patient transport, I think it's an, an issue which, um, as MSPs, we have um, raised uh, regularly. And um, I know certainly um, here in my own region, I've visited your call centre at South Queensbury and also uh, seen Lothian's patient transport, um, patient flow centre, which I think is making a big difference. Um, I know other health boards are now looking to, to replicate that. And when I was there, met with um, the embedded ambulance uh, crew there to see actually how they were playing a role in that. But as we look to the future, I certainly know um, in my own region, there'll be more going on at uh, St. John's with the regional treatment centre. I wanted to know in terms of redesigning um, patient transport systems, what work's being undertaken? Because in 2013, the committee touched on this. When we um, 
We're here in 2017, we were able to update the, the committee. We, we had achieved the objective set out in that redesign at, at, that, at that time, which was to improve punctuality uh, for patients to and from their, their, their appointments um, and to ensure that we could reduce uh, cancellations. Um, and since then, we've been working, as you described, with health boards uh, to understand how services are changing in line with changes uh, to outpatients um, and to uh, renal services and to cancer services, for, for example. So we work very closely um, with regional planning fora, with um, the health boards, and as Tom Steele's described now, with, with IJBs around uh, service, service changes. And we try to flex our model as best we, we possibly can. We've also reached out um, to try to understand what alternative providers there might be available within communities for those patients that don't require the clinical skills uh, of, our, of our ambulances. Uh, and uh, the Lothian Flow Centre is a great example where there's, there's a database of mm -hmm. providers that are available for, for patients. We also um, have databases within our, our, our ambulance control centres for those call handlers who are able to signpost people to alternatives uh, where, where those exist. And so we're continuing to to engage uh, with people and expect to continue to flex the service uh, to meet patient demand in, in the future for those that have got a clinical need for, for our service. And in terms of being able to um, put powers within um, ambulance drivers themselves and, and paramedics, what changes do you think need to be made around that? And maybe this is a question more for, for Donna Henry in terms of where you think you aren't being given the skills to be able to, to actually perform duties and stop people being taken in. You've, you've outlined some of, case, of the cases you've been involved where you haven't, but I know certainly in terms of the ability to discharge that had been raised with me, um, and whether or not that's a piece of work uh, the committee should also undertake to see if that would make an improvement. Well, as part of what we already do, we already have quite a lot of see and treat type things. It means that you can discharge when once you've um, treated your patient, but um, most of them may refer on for, for their own GP to review them if, if they don't get any better. Because bearing in mind, we're only seeing a snapshot in time. We've only seen that patient for one small time. We don't know the past, and we don't know how they're going to end up in the future. So um, it's always the safest option for a patient if we discharge them after that care, for example. Um, if they've had a hypoglycemic attack and be able to go and treat them, <coughs> and then we've been able to deal with that, no problem. And that happens, that happens regularly. And sometimes somebody with um, uncontrollable diabetes might need to be referred to a diabetic centre or their own GP, but um, that options that options available for them, but they need to do that for themselves. So effectively, we do discharge patients after we've seen them and treated them for that kind of thing. I'm still. And, and uh, uh, following up to, to Miles Briggs' question, um, so PTS is, is an extremely important part of what we do. Um, and, and it provides access to healthcare that otherwise wouldn't be available to quite a significant number of the population. Um, <clears throat> but you, you also touched on, on, on uh, hospital discharge, I think you were referring to. Um, and we now have um, in, in quite a number of the large hospitals, uh, ambulance liaison officers working very closely with the acute team in these hospitals to um, mm -hmm very much and speed up and make more efficient the discharge activities. Um, you probably might wish to say a little bit more about that, but it, it, it's, I think it's, it's something which, um, in terms of overall flow through the acute hospitals, is making a significant difference. Yes, yeah, so the, ha the hospital ambulance liaison officers are very much part of the, the hospital flow team. So they, they join the, the daily, sometimes more frequently than, than daily uh, meetings of the, of the wider um, hospital team to understand those pat patients that are potentially ready to be discharged and how we can make sure that we can best match their, their needs. Um, and that also kind of helps in terms of the, the wider flow of unscheduled care across, across local systems uh, too. So very valuable resources that were introduced a couple of winters ago they evaluate very, very well, um, and we're really keen to, to continue with those um, throughout the year now. Thank you very much. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. The creation of a new Scottish tram network, what impact has that had on their service delivery and planning? Or in hurry. Uh, new Scottish trauma network. 
Yeah, so the, 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 the Scottish Trauma Network is a very welcome development um, for, for us within the Scottish Ambulance Service. Uh, we are we're a member of the implementation um, team and we work across the regions in terms of implementation of those those networks. So you'll be aware that um, the uh, North and Tayside uh, trauma centres are now are now live and I mentioned earlier on the Scotstar North um, base that um, will be uh, live from April this year um, too. We've invested significantly significantly in terms of equipment and skills um, for, for our people and triage arrangements too and Jim Ward might want to see um, a bit more of that but we've now got a dedicated um, call handling and dispatch desk with an ambulance control so we can identify those trauma patients much more accurately um, and get, make sure that we get the right resource to them um, first time so that we can help in terms of improve those, those outcomes as part of the Scottish Trauma Network. Jim. Yeah, as, as the network matures, uh, it's going to have a huge impact on us, especially as, as, the, as the four major trauma centres and the trauma units come into be. And um, that puts a lot, of, a lot of onus on our clinicians to make the right decisions around definitive care. Um, so we're testing a, a trauma triage tool um, in terms of uh, that decision around the matching how, how unwell the patient is with the decision to, if you like, drive past a trauma unit to a major trauma centre. So there's a lot of learning. Pauline's talked about some of the, um, the, the, the elements that have been put in place. And in addition to that, we've got our first uh, advanced uh, critical care practitioner cohort being set up in Edinburgh. So there's uh, opportunities right across uh, the service in terms of um, ambulance control improvements, in terms of our specialist retrieval requirements, and in terms of our, uh, our, our A&E ambulance fleet. Um, I think the whole issue of definitive care, though, if I could just say something around that, because obviously that's at the essence of establishing major trauma centres. That doesn't just impact us in terms of trauma. It also has an impact uh, that's been long-standing in terms of uh, heart, heart attack centres for PCI. More and more, we're seeing uh, centralisation of uh, children's services for good reason, I would say, in terms of specialist provision. Um, and also, uh, likely, uh, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have stroke units at the moment, but as a thrombectomy service comes in, comes in, comes in to, to be in, in the coming period, um, there will be ever more um, responsibility on SAS to understand the needs of the patients and to really be getting these pathways right. So the, the, the trauma is, is one live uh, and active and really interesting challenge at the moment. Um, but I think this is something uh, that as, as, a, as an ambulance service with a responsibility to glue a lot of these pathways together, um, it's a huge responsibility for us in terms of regional and more local planning. Um, thank you for convener. Of the two centres that's opened, Aberdeen and Dundee, are they given improved outcomes for patients? The data around outcomes uh, is pulled together by STAG, the Scottish Trauma Audit, Audit Group. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that at this stage we haven't got enough data to, to support that. So what we are looking at, um, you know, the, the outcome will be based on a number of processes. So that will be around clear understanding about bypass protocols, triage and the like. Um, but that uh, STAG's got a long track record of publishing really good evaluations uh, and that will be the source of that outcome data uh, which, will, which will be generated in the coming period. Thank you. But confirming, I think, that the trauma centres, the major trauma centres which are in place are already affecting the way the service operates in those regions, is that? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sandra Hart. Thank you very much, convener. <clears throat> I'd wanted to follow on about the patient transport, which I think is, is really, really important, and also perhaps the financial aspects, although I know one of my colleagues is going to come in with the financial aspects after. Um, you mentioned the fact that I think it was in the East Lothian area about the depot, and the fact that you have uh, records of a database, basically about <coughs> patient transport, and you also mentioned working more closely with IGBs and voluntary sector, because that, that's really, really important, and not using the ambulances. With uh, what's happening with the IGBs, do you think it, it will, will come to a point where every area will have a, a database of patient transport, which will not necessarily, you know, use of ambulances or taxis or that type of thing? Just a bit more clarification on how far we can go 
because I know it's a costly exercise and obviously not just that, but it's a time exercise as well for people who are being transported in ambulances or whatever. Paul and Harry. Yeah, it would it would be fantastic if there was um, such a such a database. Um, the last time that we uh, looked to try to understand what alternative provision there was out there, there was over a thousand different different providers mm. uh, that worked uh, to different criteria at different times of the day, at different days of the of the week. Um, so it is um, quite challenging to mm. continue to make sure that such a database would be um, up up to date. Um, but there are certainly a range of uh, different providers that we uh, know um, that our patients or um, others and uh, their carers can access and can do so uh, reliably. And they're certainly on, on our databases and we're really keen to add to that um, as often as we, as we possibly can. And you're right, the, the integrated joint boards, community planning partners, and indeed the transport authorities um, are key partners in terms of helping us understand just what alternative provision there might be um, out there to support, mm. support patients. So it's something that we work really closely with. And we have um, ambulance liaison groups with each NHS uh, board where we, we again we try to share information um, so that we can between us um, help patients navigate the, the right support for their needs at that particular point in time. I think Mr Steele wanted to come in. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I, 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 did, I think um, I spoke earlier about, it, about us increasingly working with the IGBs mm -hmm. and, and, and right down to locality levels. Um, when we are a national service, but increasingly we've got to deliver on three different levels. One is national, and, and in regard to David Torrance's comment, for example, around trauma networks, that's a national network, and, and we have to plan on that basis. Um, at, at a health board level, we, we have to plan because, because they, each health board has different numbers of hospitals and different facilities and different pathways. And then down, down to health and social care partnership levels. Increasingly, and this is quite new for us, I think that's where the value of these of partnerships are, are going to be seen in direct um, impact on the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's quite helpful to think of it in that way. And, and it's, a, it's a new way for us to start working. But from, from discussions I've had with IJB uh, accountable officers, uh, they do seem to be increasingly very keen to engage with us. Just a small thank you. I think uh, most of the concerns that come from, from constituents and patients as well is if they get in an ambulance or transport at nine in the morning by the time they get home or even to the hospital, it's maybe three hours later and that's unfortunately sort of the norm and that was why I was wanting to see if we could get a database as such. Certainly, obviously, my area, Glasgow Kelvin, it's much easier, but when you're up north or the islands, it's uh, much more difficult and it's also much more costly. Uh, and I just wonder if you'd looked at that situation, if you're coming from the islands or Oban or wherever it may be, you have someone coming down, sometimes in a taxi, never mind an ambulance, with perhaps a family member to accommodate, and that takes a, an overnight stay uh, in that respect. So I wonder if you would be looking at that in particular as well for these far-reaching areas. So so we, we work closely with, with, with health boards and you might be aware of uh, various uh, different ways of, of, of providing outpatient consultations such as through uh, video technology um, now um, and I know that some of the island uh, communities um, are, are, are big users um, of those types of consultations where they, those, are, those are appropriate for the, for the patient uh, needs. Uh, we do in very remote areas um, also um, have arrangements in place where if we have capacity um, on our tra patient transport vehicles then and we will uh, try to help those patients that might not strictly meet the clinical criteria, but obviously it would make sense uh, to, to ensure that we could meet their, their needs uh, to get to their <coughs> healthcare appointments as well. So, so we do flex it where it's possible to, to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Ryan uh, Good morning to the panel. I say, I often think when we are doing these, these types of investigations, uh, we, tend to, we tend to always be looking at the negatives. I just wanted to say on record, that as, as with, with everybody else, and I hope you recognise the high regard in which we uh, hold our frontline, frontline staff. I think sometimes the language as politicians and media use when we're discussing healthcare uh, uh, it could be improved. And I think also there's a recognition in here that um, you're asked, being asked to deliver a really crucial service under increasing uh, financial constraints. 
Um, I know the board were expecting to break even, uh, 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 be in a break even position at the end of financial year, and, and as of October, there was that overspend of, of uh, 1.3 million. I know there are uh, reasons for that. I wonder has that overspend been addressed, and will you be back on track to, to break even within the financial year? Pauline Howe. Yeah. So there's been significant investment in, in, in our service, but there remain significant cost pressures and, and, and challenges, as, as you alluded to as well. So we have um, had a very intensive efficiency um, identification programme and delivery plan in place. Um, we are on track to achieve our financial targets uh, this, this year. Um, it is con of concern to the board that some of those uh, savings are being achieved on a non-recurrent basis at the moment. Uh, so we've been working very closely with our staff, uh, their representatives and, and managers across the service to understand where the opportunities for better value are. And we've benchmarked uh, our performance in terms of efficiency and effectiveness with the Lord Carter Review of UK of English ambulance services. Uh, we do compare very well there, but again, we're not complacent. We're work working to understand where we might make more, more savings. And looking forward into next financial year, given that we're at the stage of developing our three-year financial plan uh, now, we have a, a best value pipeline of, of, of ideas that we're taking uh, through and presenting to our board shortly of over of over £8 million that we want to try to achieve in the, in the coming uh, year to help us make our financial targets next year. Okay. If I could, um, the Audit Scotland um, report was suggesting that you're relying on recurrent savings to meet financial targets uh, and that the board actually recognise themselves that this is not a sustainable position. Um, I think also in theory that the, the management forecast that recurrent savings are required of in excess of £27 million to continue to operate in a, in a financially sustainable way. Um, and, and again, Audit Scotland said this represents a significant challenge. I was wondering whether you consider that this sort of level of uh, savings is achievable. I think most importantly, while maintaining uh, uh, the level of service that, that, that you want to achieve. Tom Steele. <coughs> Can I confirm the number you said? That Twenty-seven million. We have uh, well, the the, the by twenty 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 by twenty two twenty three, the management forecast that recurring savings are required of over twenty-seven million to continue to operate in a financial sustainable way. That's the figures. I personally don't recognise that number. Perhaps the chief executive doesn't, and, and, and I'll let her respond in a minute. Okay. But but um, I, can I assure the committee the the importance to which the board. Uh, addresses financial matters. Uh, as you rightly said, Brian Whittle, we were um, at halfway through the year uh, in significant deficit and a, a programme which the Chief Executive has referred to, um, to uh, in, in find short-term savings, um, uh, which we have been successful in doing. Um, but more importantly, that approach is not, is not a one-off. That approach is going to be embedded into the organisation going forward. And it's for that reason that we, we are as a board committed to reducing any reliance on, on uh, in-year savings and, and, and uh, have the return on a sustainable <coughs> basis. Um, your question about uh, what happens going forward, can we sustain everything we want to do? Um, we are funded for next year in, in an appropriate way. Um, thereafter, um, we are preparing our three-year plan and, and we will await um, come back from government on that. Pauline, how do you want to comment on the three-year financial plan? So I, th I think the, the figure you refer to is probably the cumulative uh, figure by, by, by that time, yeah. and there's no doubt that that is um, a very a very challenging um, ask of us as, as a service, but as the Chairman has said, uh, we are working very closely uh, with uh, staff and representatives and managers to identify opportunities uh, for us to improve uh, value and make savings. And as I said earlier on, certainly in terms of new ways of working, um, we are able to demonstrate that there's an economic value value to investment in the service in terms of the wider health and social care economy too. Yeah, just, just one, one more supplement. I mean, inevitably, the, the, the opportunity to, to, to make those sort of cost savings are diminishing as you, as you identify them. Is there a concern there that uh, the, the front line is going to suffer uh, if we continue to squeeze? 
when the board makes its assessment of um, the agreement or otherwise of our savings programme, a frontline service provision is at absolutely top of the of the priority. So we do all we can to protect frontline service um, provision, and certainly um, the the savings programmes to date uh, have not adversely impacted on on frontline service provision, and that would be our, our aim to continue to do so. Okay. And are you confident of that? Is it possible? to continue to bear down on costs in the way that you've described without affecting the core service that you provide? As I said, um, we are focused on achieving uh, the financial targets uh, that have been set uh, for us. We have indicative allocations uh, for next year. We are uh, taking proposals to our board next month around our, our budget for that year, and we're in the process of developing that three-year financial plan. And we have to work on assumptions that we will agree with, with the Scottish Government in, in, that, in that time. Very briefly, Sandra. A point of clarification. Uh, I, I noticed in the financial sustainability, uh, an overspend of 1.3 million, and basically that was for 2018. And basically the reason for that is, is stated as um, the cost of diesel and travel and substance. Uh, it mentions that. Do the ambulance service get discounted um, fuel? have um, a procurement process in place that gets us a discount on, on, on fuel prices right. um, and uh, we uh, look to make sure that that's best value uh, in terms of uh, uh, opportunities for the public, the public purse. I mentioned the benchmarking with England. We're constantly benchmarking to make sure mm -hmm. that we can get the best from any procurement opportunities. So we do collaborate in terms of procurement um, across UK ambulance services, across um, NHS Scotland, across the uh, Scottish public sector as, as well. So we take advantage of all those op opportunities. And I think about over 90% of our non-pay spend um, is through collaborative procurement opportunities. Okay. Um, and our final uh, supplementary from uh, Miles Briggs. Just um, in terms of financial uh, management, it was with regards to overtime payments, because I know in terms of the statistics we were given that had reached over £6 million pounds in 2017-18. So I just wondered, in terms of, um, you know, given staff shortages and the impact of overtime, um, where that stands today? To advise that overtime is coming is coming down. Um, I mentioned earlier on that we've got 500 more staff now than we had in 20 and 2015, and because we've got those additional staff who are now trained um, and focus on delivering those services to patients, we've been able to to reduce um, overtime. There's also one-off reasons why we we have um, overtime, um, such as whilst those staff were in training, for example, um, and also for events such as the European Championships and other types of events like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I thank all our witnesses today for a very full uh, answers to a range of questions. And uh, uh, I, I know that in the course of those questions and answers, there have been some points raised where you've offered to provide further information. Uh, there are also additionally, there will be points which we would like to follow up with you in correspondence. Uh, so you will hear from us uh, shortly on those. But thank you very much for your attendance today. We will now adjourn brief, suspend briefly uh, and then resume in private session in, in a couple of minutes. Thanks very much.